I started renting and selling real estate pre-internet when everything was done manually. And if you've been around, you know the grief and frustration caused by paper checks. My worst day involves a misprinted check, an overturned beer truck, and four hours of wasted drive time. We all have these stories. But over the last 26 years, almost every step in the transaction has been so, um, and finally, things have been too. Deposit link is a missing link that eliminates the inefficiencies caused by paper checks. With deposit link, real estate just gets done easier. Please welcome Shay Hara. Go ahead and get started. So give me a second to share my screen. And then we are going to jump right in because we have a lot to get over or go through today. So I really appreciate you all being here. There are a lot of you today. Um, so I am going to do my best to answer questions as they come up in the chat box today. So please feel free to put questions in there and I will try to get through them as best I can. And then we will leave a few minutes at the end for some additional questions. So let's jump in how to start over in a new city or run a virtual real estate business so hopefully that is what you all are here to learn about today because that is what i am here to talk about so a little bit about me i am an ivy league grad i'm a residential realtor in chicago illinois the funny part is that i actually live in denver um so i do not live in chicago and i know somebody just asked are we allowed to record we're going to actually record this and send it to you so no need for you to record it um so i have been a realtor for about 11 years this is my third business so uh previous to this i owned um, an art education company for kids and i owned a newsletter business my husband and i uh, he's been in real estate for about 25 years his name is nobuhata some of you may know him he worked for the national association of realtors for quite a while and now we live in denver because he is the ceo of the denver metro association of realtors so we used to live in minnesota my husband was a realtor there then he got the job offer to move to chicago and so we decided we'd give it a go so we moved to chicago i sold my businesses that i had in minnesota uh, we moved there and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was in my early 30s at that point. You know, I had made a good deal of money from selling my businesses. So I decided to take about six months off and I just did nothing. I stayed home in my pajamas. Uh, I made a whole bunch of Pinterest projects that were terrible. Um, and so finally, after about six months, my husband came home and said, look, you know, you just made a giant H out of yarn for our front door and I can't even tell what it is. So please get a job. He was like, I don't care what the job is, just get some sort of a job. So he was like, why don't you try real estate? I think you would like it. I think you would be really good at it. And so I decided to give it a go. The challenge was that I knew nothing about real estate other than watching my husband do real estate. I didn't know anything about Chicago. I had never really been there before we moved there. So I had no sphere. It was overwhelming to me, even just trying to get to Target because we're from Alaska and I wasn't used to the crazy traffic. And so I would cry just trying to figure out how to drive to Target because of all the traffic. You know, so going from no sphere, not knowing anything about real estate, not even knowing the city at all or anything, I then had to figure out how I get started in real estate, right? And like a lot of you, it was very tough those first couple of years. My first year in business, I did one transaction for 131,000 and that was it. My second year in business, fortunately, I was able to get up to about 7 million in business. By my third year, I was doing 15 million in business and then it's gone up from there. So now I do about 150 to 180 transactions a year, about 60 million in business. I have a small team, so it's myself and two other agents, and we have four part-time assistants. Um, and so during, right at the beginning of the pandemic, my husband got this call off. You know, I think we should move to Denver. And I'm like, are you crazy? I have this huge real estate business here in Chicago. How am I going to move to Denver and do real estate in Chicago? And so I talked to people all over the country uh, and pretty much the consensus was you're just gonna have to quit your real estate business. And I was like, I'm not willing to do that. There has to be a better way where in this 
Zoom world now because of the pandemic, I can still continue my business. And so that's what I've really done for the past two years and is what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about today. So now I work completely remote from Denver. I go back to Chicago about once a quarter. Um, I typically go back when one of the team members is on vacation, and then I usually put in some client events at the same time so that I can see a whole bunch of clients. So I'm going to kind of talk to you about how I've been able to make that not only work, but actually benefit our clients. And I'll explain to you why it benefits our clients for me to not be there. Um, and then also kind of some different models that are available to you. So hopefully that's what you came here to learn today. Again, as I said, we're going to be recording this. So we'll send that out to everybody at the end. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Okay. So once you decide, you know, maybe you're thinking about moving part time, maybe you want to winter in Florida and you live in a cold climate during the rest of the year, maybe you want to pick up your business and completely move to a new place, or maybe you're just a new agent and you're on this Zoom today so you can try to get some ideas to grow your business, right? So I'm going to try to present you with ideas for all of those things. So if you have an existing business and you're thinking about moving to a new city, whether that's part time or whether you want to do that full time, you have some different options available to you. So the first option would be what I call option one. That's going to be more of your normal referral model. OK, so for that option, you find somebody to refer all of your existing business to. And then you have to figure out how are you going to get compensated for referring all of that business to them? Typically, what we see is a 25% referral fee for those initial referrals. And then after that, it's going to be a per transaction fee that's a smaller amount, okay? So we're going to start off kind of talking about what your options are with your old business when you move to the new city. And then we're also going to talk about how to get a business up and running in a new city, okay? So for those people who are still, you know, in the old city and you're getting those referrals coming in, Typically, it's going to be that 25% referral fee and then that downline per transaction referral fee, you know, of maybe 10%. I've heard some people do 10% for the second referral, 5% for the third referral that comes in, etc. Okay. In order to keep that model working, you're need to, going to have regular touch points with past clients to keep those leads coming in. Okay. So what I would suggest is setting up a 10 to 15 year follow-up campaign. I have that through my CRM. So I use Realvolve for my CRM. And so we have monthly emails that go out to every single client in our database that has bought a property from us in the past. Ideas for those types of follow-ups would be quarterly maintenance reminders, reminders to pay their property taxes, reminders to, um, you know, to if they're going to be remodeling, kind of what are the current trends, things like that, right? So think about what would be helpful tips in your market for your current clients who own houses already, okay? And think about some seasonal ones, right? So we have an email that goes out if it's going to rain really heavily, and I'm worried about people's basements flooding. So we then send an email out about, hey, we need to make sure you keep your drains clear. I'm worried about your basements flooding. Or if it's really cold and I'm worried about their pipes freezing, we'll send an email out saying, hey, it's going to be below zero tonight. I'm really worried about your pipes freezing. Here's what you need to do to prevent your pipes from freezing. Here's what you do if they freeze. So you can have automatic emails that go out. And then on top of that, you can have some manual emails that go out. I would also suggest texting them regularly to keep in touch, you know, so maybe once a quarter you go through your database and you say, hey, I just want to check in with you, see how you're doing, how's everything at the house, do you need anything from me? Because if you're not keeping in contact with those past clients, they're not going to think about sending you business, right? So the upside of this model, option one, is that it's a lot less work for you. You pass them off to somebody else, all you have to do is make that introduction, and then after that, you don't have to do any additional work. The downside and the reason that I didn't choose this model when I moved is that eventually your business is going to die out. So it isn't really a long-term strategy. You can probably make it work for four, five, six years of some income coming in, but it's going to be really hard to make it work longer than that. Okay. So 
what I decided to do instead was what I decided was option two. I didn't want to give up my existing business. And instead, I wanted to grow that business, even though I wasn't going to be living in Chicago anymore. So what I did was essentially formed a team. I already had a small team before that of one agent. I brought on a second agent. And what we started telling people was that we were now going to assign two agents to every client and that we were doing that because we wanted to give them a better customer service experience. So I am the main person. I work with everybody. And then either David or Lauren, who are the two other agents on my team, one of them gets assigned to each client as well. And what we tell our clients is that this market moves so fast that you really need two full-time agents working for you. One agent is going to be in the field all the time doing the showings, the inspections, the final walkthroughs with you, et cetera. The other agent, in this case, me, is going to be manning the computer. And so we do a text thread with all of us. So it'll be the clients, myself, and then the other agent that's assigned to them will have a text thread. They can text us anytime that what they have questions about properties, if they want to see a property, I will answer those questions. So I literally man the computer all day. I answer their questions. I will set up the showings. And then really where the benefit comes into the client is we can write offers very quickly and do pricing analysis really quickly. So what'll happen is if they're working with say Lauren, they will leave a showing. If they really like that property, she'll text me and say, hey, I just left one, two, three, four Main Street with the clients. They loved it. Can you pull comps and get the offer written up? And what we tell the client is, my goal is by the time you get home, I already have the pricing analysis done and in your email, and I already have the draft offer written up so that ideally we can get an offer in within an hour or two of you leaving a showing. And what we explained to the clients is before when we, it was just one agent assigned to them, that agent might be in um, showings from eight in the morning until eight o'clock at night. And it's impossible then for that, that agent to have time to do pricing analysis and get an offer over to them because they're in showings all the time. So what we have actually found is that by having a two agent model for every client now, our clients have a much better customer service experience. And typically we're able to get them under contract more because we can get offers in really fast now and sometimes avoid multiple offer situations. So it's really been a benefit to our client. And when we explain it that way to the clients, they think it's great. They're like, that sounds fantastic. I love this idea that I have two people dedicated to me. We're typically able to respond to their emails and texts within a couple of minutes. We're able to get them into it for showings quickly. We also have backup showing agents. So if Lauren or David on my team are not available to show them a property, we'll bring on another showing agent to show them. So they just have a better experience. So that is how we positioned it to the clients. Most of the clients don't even know that I am not there in Chicago anymore and that I'm living in Denver. It just doesn't come up. Um, so Peggy asked, do I get pushback from clients who think I need to see the property in person in order to serve them best and give a condition option of condition? Well, they are having somebody, Lauren is there. So she'll call me and say, you know, hey, for the comps, you should know this, that, and the other thing. So we are seeing it with them. And then if I have questions about the comps, I can call Lauren and say, hey, you know, how does this compare to this? So we'll talk back and forth. So they do have somebody seeing the property with them in person. And I know there's a lot of questions about compensation. I will like look at that, okay, in just a second. Um, and then Jill asks, what if it does come up the, to clients that I'm not physically there? It doesn't matter because I'm not going and doing the showings. I'm just doing the pricing analysis, the comps. I'm typically then submitting the offer. I'm doing all the offer negotiations. I'm doing all the inspection negotiations. So we just tell them my job is to man the computer and take care of all the negotiations. I have a degree from Harvard in negotiations. So that is really my specialty. And then Lauren and David, their specialty is going out and doing the showing. So we kind of explain it as like surgeons, you know, every surgeon has a different specialty. That's really how our, our business model works. We each have our own specialty. Their specialty is showings, looking for inspection items, you know, helping sellers declutter, those kinds of things. My specialty is the negotiations, the pricing analysis, all of those kinds of things, okay? So in order to make this work, there's a couple of tricks that I have learned. The first thing is that in Facebook, you can have client lists or what are called friend lists, okay? So what you're gonna wanna do is 
take all of your clients and put them in one particular list in Facebook. And then what happens is my team members will send me social media that I can post on my Facebook page. So every time they go to a showing or an inspection or a final walkthrough, they'll take video, they'll send it to me. I'm able to post it on there as well as them. Okay. And then if I want to post things about Denver for my friends and family who are in the Denver area, I can post that on a separate list that my Chicago clients don't have to see. So I don't lie. I don't say I live in Chicago anymore to anybody. If people ask, I tell them I live in Denver, but I also don't want to make it front and center in front of their face that I'm constantly posting about Denver. So if I'm going to post about Denver, I will put that on my Denver Facebook list. If I'm going to post about Chicago stuff, I will post that in my Chicago Facebook list. So you can create different lists. Okay. Then one of the things you have to decide is if you're also going to work in the new city, which I don't, I just work in Chicago, you know, then I would let everybody know and say, hey, you know, I now work in Denver and I work in Chicago, right? You know, so advertise that to the world. If you're only going to continue to work in your one city, then I don't think you necessarily need to advertise that to the world. Um, so Diane asked, do I sell in Denver too? I do not. Um, somebody, a bunch of people have asked, do I have to have brokers for both states? No, I'm just remote. My broker is still in Chicago. That's where my business is. That's where our office is. That's where the umbrella policy that covers me for ENO and all of those things are. It's just like if you went on vacation and you were someplace else, you don't have to have a broker in that state. I'm just working remotely, but all the business is being done in Chicago. Okay. It's very similar to a showing agent. Okay. So then how do you handle expenses? How do you handle commissions? Okay. So for my team, what I decided to do is if it's a uh, client that I brought in to the team, then we handle commissions 50-50. So 50% stays with me, 50% goes with the other agent that is assigned to that client, okay? With expenses, I pay for all of the expenses, but I do ask for a per transaction fee from the agents on my team. And I think I have that on the next slide. Um, so I have that per transaction fee, and that is a $250 per transaction fee that they pay. And so that helps cover, you know, some of the administration costs, some of their gifts, all of those kinds of things. So they just send those to me as soon as that transaction ends, okay? So that's how we handle expenses and commissions. I think it is important that you have FaceTime. So I go back typically once a quarter for all of the events. I'm going back next week. There's an award ceremony through our association that I'm going back for. And then we're hosting a whole bunch of client events over the course of the week where clients can pop by donut shops in the morning and I'm gonna buy them some donuts and coffee and things like that. Um, so I always go back for any sort of events. If I have a very high-end client, I will poten potentially go back for that if I need to go back for a listing presentation or if one of the agents goes out of town, I will go back for that so that I can help cover the showings. So I go back about four to six times a, um, a year um, to go back for different things. Okay. I think it's really important. If you are going to move out of town, let the other realtors that you work with and the lenders know that you've moved. I get a ton of referral business now, um, from lenders and realtors who are calling me constantly being like, Hey, I have clients moving to Denver. Do you want them? I chose not to get my license in Denver because I'm so busy with the business back in Chicago. I just don't have time and I really don't have interest in growing a new business. I don't have interest in doing showings again. It's really nice for me to not have to do showings. I don't have to go to inspections or final walkthroughs. My schedule is much freer now than it was before when I had to do all those things. So I have no interest in going back and doing those things again. But if I were to get my license in Denver, I would have a ton of business coming in because I'm literally getting phone calls and, and texts every single week from realtors and lenders in Chicago trying to send business my way. So I would let people know if you are going to do business in your new city that you have moved because you probably have a good reputation in your old city, okay? So um, how do I do it? We've talked about this a little bit. So I have the two realtors on my team. We also have four assistants who are all part-time. So we have a transaction coordinator. She works about 20 to 30 hours a week. 
We have a client concierge. So her job is to book inspections for clients, book estimates that they might want to get done. She'll get moving quotes for them. She takes care of ordering all of our gifts for our clients. Um, and then we also have a marketing and event coordinator who handles all of our marketing, our social media, our events. We also have what I call a runner. So she just runs around about 10 hours a week. She drops off flyers at open houses and brochures. She'll put lock boxes on all of those kinds of things, okay? Then we also have some showing assistants um, who are our backup showing assistants. So somebody asked, do I have a lot of high turnover on my team? I don't actually. Um, my my uh, shortest person that I've had with me has been with me for five years. Um, so I don't have any turnover on my team. Everybody is very well compensated. Um, my buyer, my agents on my team, one of them made over $400,000 last year. So they have no interest in going anywhere else. They don't, all they have to do is handle showings and inspections and final walkthroughs and some texts. They don't have to handle any administrative tasks. Gifts are all taken care of for them. I write all the contracts. So it's a very good relationship for all of us. Okay. So as I talked about, they kind of handle all of those things. I handle all the computer work. So I will take all the new client intakes. I will arrange those appointments. Typically what happens then is we have a new buyer or seller survey that we'll send out to potential new clients. Um, when those clients come in, then we will do a Zoom call with myself and either David or Lauren with those clients so we can all get to know each other. We'll ask follow-up questions we have based on their survey results. From there, then we will explain to them how we work. So we'll explain that I handle the computer, I take care of all the pricing, all the negotiations, writing the offer, all of those kinds of things, that the other person takes care of all the in-person work so that they understand how everything works, okay? So I do a lot of Zoom because I want that face-to-face -face with the clients as much as I can. So we'll do new buyer and seller calls over Zoom. Once I write up the contract, I will schedule a Zoom. I will hop on with the client, share my screen. We'll go over the contract together because you know they're developing that relationship with David and Lauren out in the field, but I wanna make sure that I develop a relationship with them as well so that that referral business continues to come in, okay? So anytime we're doing inspection negotiations, I will hop on a Zoom with them to write up the inspection response, pricing analysis, if it's for a listing appointment, again, I will do that on Zoom so that they can get that face-to-face -face time with me. And I think it's really important that you explain the advantages to the clients of having two full-time agents available to them, okay? I also think that if you're going to not be in the city you are in, you need to increase your social media dramatically as well as online things that you can do. So we do a lot of online Zoom classes. So we did a class about 10 things to know if you're planning to buy in uh, 2022, 10 things to know if you're planning to sell in 22. And so I'll do those via Zoom. We do a lot of pop buys where either, and I'll show you some examples of these where people can pop by our offices. Um, to pick up some gifts whenever they would like. So, you know, we might have, uh, you know, it poinsettias in December, they can stop by and pick up, et cetera, or we'll do pop buys at their location where we'll drop things off, okay? We also do a lot of events, as I've said, where I'll go back four to five times a year for events. Um, and then we do a lot of mailings. And then for social media, we try to post on social media in our stories section. So I think it's important that you have a business page, but I think it's more important that you're posting in the story section on your personal page. That's the section at the top where things stay there for 24 hours at a time. My feeling is post a lot on there about um, about real estate because people have to click into it in order to see it. And so they're really opting in and we are in a very visual business. So as much as you can post on there, do, you know, post a picture of yourself writing up a contract. When you have a new property going on, post coming soon or post just listed and put that in that, um, that story section, right? Lauren is really good about, she'll go to an inspection and she'll have a, you know, the inspector shoot a 10 second video about an inspection tip. She'll send it to me and I can post that in my social media as well, right? So really think about just because you're not there anymore doesn't mean you don't want to be front and center with posting tips about real estate, posting what you're doing. Keeping Current Matters is a great source that I really like. Um, so they have free newsletters that you can sign up for and they send them out every day and they have great graphics 
in there that you can post on your social media as well that I really like, okay? So I know people have been asking about what is the compensation if they bring in the client? So in that case, then if I bring in the client, it's 50-50. If they bring in the client, they keep 60% and I keep 40% because I want to encourage them to help grow the business. And so they need to keep bringing people in, in order for that to happen. Okay. So I want to encourage them to do so. Right. So here's how the finances work. Um, that transaction fee, my lead 50, 50, their lead, um, I get 40%, they get 60%. Right. I also do a lot of gifts and bonuses. So, you know, if we've had a really busy month, you know, like we've put on, I think in the last week and a half, we put on like 10 listings, something like that. So from there, um, you know, then I will, you know, send them a gift card to go to the spa, go have a massage, you know, go take an afternoon off. And I really want to make sure that they are having a nice life, you know, so they take vacations whenever they want. I will come into town and cover their vacations or we'll hire people, you know, and pay people to cover their showings. You know, I want them to have time off on the weekends and during the week, like I want them to have a very balanced life. And so what I find from both of them is what they have told me is they make way more money now working with me than they did before when they were on their own, um, you know, their in their pay has increased by five to 10 times, depending on the agent, because I bring in a ton of leads for the team. So I am the main source of bringing the leads in. And then in addition to that, they have a lot more free time, even though they're out showing properties and stuff all day long, they're not having to deal with emails that much or text messages, they're not having to deal with admin work, they're not having to really pay for hardly any expenses because I'm paying all of the expenses. So it works out really well for them. So what the agents on the team have said is they are much happier with this model than they were when they were agents on their own because they make more money, they have a lot more time off, it's a lot less headaches, okay? So kind of quick thing about compensation, right? All right, so we talked a little bit about kind of social media and I do think that that is very important. I think you should be posting in that story section at least daily and ideally if you can three to four times a day. And then on your Facebook wall, I think you should be posting about real estate once or twice a week, but don't try to make it, you know, super obvious of like, hey, if you're, you know, if you know anyone buying or selling, please send them my way. I would try to make it a little bit more subtle than that. So I like to post a lot of like our pot buys that we're doing, our events, um, you know, if, if it is going to rain really heavily and I'm worried about people's basements flooding, I'll post something about that. But I want to make um, this more about my personal page being clients just getting to know me. So I'll post, you know, pictures of me and my kid out doing stuff. I have a five-year-old, you know, I'll post us going on vacation and doing stuff because I really think that people want to work with people that they like. And that is what your personal Facebook page is, is to share your life with people and just be a real human being to them. Okay, so really amp your social media if you're going to go out of town. So these are some examples that Lauren on my team posts. She's really great at social media. She gets a ton of clients from Instagram. So she'll post on both Facebook and Instagram. That's where a large portion of her clients come in from. So she posts probably five to six times a day on, um, on her social media. Somebody asked, how do I compete with 100% commission companies? Well, my commission split with my company is very, very high. It's almost 100%. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I think the question really becomes those people at 100% commission companies, how many leads are they bringing in? Are they bringing in enough leads to be able to do 175 transactions a year with really no expenses? Typically not. So for my team, I'm bringing in a ton of leads. I'm paying all the expenses. It's a really great deal for them financially. Okay. So something else you can do, and I took this idea from my friend, Karen Ling, who lives in Hawaii, she does coffee with Karen. So you can do this whether you're starting a business in a new market, you're just gonna continue your business in your existing market or you wanna to move to a new market. So once a month, it's usually like the last Wednesday of every month, she does this online coffee with Karen. So it's basically an hour on Zoom where she'll be available to answer any real estate questions that you have. If you sign up in advance, then she will send you a like $5 gift card to a local coffee shop. And the idea is that you can get a cup of coffee, hop online, you can ask her any questions you might have about buying, selling, et cetera. Um, you can just ask her questions about, hey, I'm thinking of remodeling. What kind of color should I do? Because I think if you talk to clients, oftentimes they feel like they don't want to bother you and they don't want to ask you a lot of questions because you're busy. And so this gives them 
one time a month where you're just available for an hour. She Facebooks it live at the same time. And what she has said is, you know, if nobody shows up, no big deal. She's just on her computer doing work, but typically she does have, you know, five, 10 people that show up and ask her questions. And so it's a great way for her to connect with clients. And it's also a great way for her once a month to have something specific to send out via her CRM email and just remind people she's a realtor and that she is available for any types of questions that she has. Okay. Um, and somebody asked, does Karen make sure that those that tune into the coffee with Karen aren't currently working with an agent? No, that's not her problem. You know, if somebody who tunes in has an agent, yeah, that's up to them, right? Whether they tune in or not, okay? Um, Stacey Ireland Berry is a friend of mine who's in the Indianapolis area. And I love this idea that she does. So what she does is every year she um, posts a post that basically says, if you're a Girl Scout and you are going to be selling Girl Scout cookies, call and pitch her. And, um, and then she will buy a box of Girl Scout cookies from your daughter. And so I love this because she is a very successful female entrepreneur. She is encouraging other female entrepreneurs at the same time. So if she's not available, they leave her a voicemail and they pitch her on the voicemail. Um, you know, and it's just been a very successful way for her to connect with her clients. And as a mom, you know, I have a little boy, but if I had a little girl, I would love this idea as well that, you know, my daughter could, you know, practice kind of pitching her uh, sales skills, right? So these are some great ideas you can do regardless of what market you're in. So another agent in my Marcus Lee and my off, uh, my market area Lee Marcus he does these great pot buys which is where I got the idea from so he will have pot buys at his office every month and you can stop by any time during that month and pick up something. So in October, he did free happy apples. So you could stop by, get a free happy yeah, yeah, sure. apple. And I love that you don't have to actually go somewhere and drop off the pot buys, right? Because that's a lot of work. So this is a nice, easy way to do pot buys. You can do this in your old market. You can do this in your new market, wherever you want to do it. Another idea, which I took on, um, so App Properties is a brokerage in my market. They've been doing these App Property Loves Local. So this is more on a brokerage level, but I started doing it just on a team level. So they'll partner with local businesses and they'll say, hey, stop in anytime on Wednesday between 10 and noon, show this photo and you can pick up a free donut or you know, coffee on us or ice cream or whatever it is. So we're actually doing that next week. We've partnered up with, I think, six different bakeries, local bakeries in in different parts of the city and the suburbs where we work. I'm going to go there and be the, there for the two hours at each bakery. People can come in, say hi to me. I'm going to buy them, you know, a cup of coffee and some donuts or whatever it is. So, you know, these are great things that you can either go there and do in person or you don't have to. You can just have people show it on their phone and go there and you're paying the bill essentially, right? So easy type pop buys and events that you can do. I think it's also really important that you do some mailings, okay? So um, I hate just listed and just sold because I felt that people look at them for one second and throw them away. And I just found for me, they were a big waste of money. They may work really well for you. Kudos to you if they do. But for me, they don't. What I found worked much better is to do a quarterly recap of sales. OK, so for those sales. Just list out everything that you have for sale, everything that you have under contract and everything that you've had closed. And even if that's just one or two things, it's still better than putting it on there and just having a just listed postcard, right? And mail that out to everybody in your sphere. If you're trying to start a business in a new market, then mail that out to everybody in your farm market that you want to market to. So maybe you mail that out to everybody in a neighborhood. Or if there was a neighborhood in your old market you wanted to market to, mail it out to them. I typically just mail it out to my sphere because I have a very large sphere now at this point. And what I have found with these is that these are very effective because when I started sending those out, I had a lot of clients who would reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, Shay, I had no idea you did this type of business. And I'm like, yeah, I do a lot of business. Right. And people want to work with people who are successful agents who are very busy. And so by showing the volume of business that you do, it gives people a lot of credibility in their eyes that they should want to work with you. OK, so 
I also think it's important to do something at the end of the year as well. So this is one we did three years ago. We were at 36 million for the year. So we sent that out. Um, a friend of mine, um, she does kind of a funny one. So she'll talk on there about, you know, this is how many text messages she sent out. This was how many times she stopped at Starbucks. This was time, how many times she wanted to hit her head against the wall, you know, just all sorts of funny things. Mine tend to be more serious because that's my personality, but I think you can make this cheeky and funny as well so that it's memorable for people, okay? Something else that's really good to do in, uh, in your market is AdWorks. So AdWorks is online retargeting. So what you can do is it's essentially the same idea as like if you were gonna buy a pair of boots and you don't buy the boots and now the ad for the boots follows you all around the internet, you can do the exact same thing with your face. So you can see my old ad um, before I added other team members on the right-hand side. What you do is you put in email addresses. So you can put in all of your clients in here. And then this ad is going to show up anywhere they are looking online for information. So that might be CNN, ESPN, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, wherever they're online for information, these ads will show up. So again, just a good way for you to keep top of mind with everybody in your old sphere, okay, while you're potentially working on building up a new sphere in your new market. What I also like about this is I can put people in this list who I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable um, emailing because it would be considered spam, but I feel comfortable putting them in this list so that my ad shows up on their screen. So an example of that would be, say I wanted to do business in the Denver market, right? I could take all of the parents from my son's school and put them in this AdWorks campaign and have the ad show up for them. And then I could say, you know, if you use me, I'll donate 10% of my, my proceeds, you know, from your sale back to Black Forest Hills Elementary, right? So, you know, maybe in your new market, if you're going to try business in your new market, you join a church. Maybe you put everybody from the church in there and you say, hey, if you use me, I'll donate 10% back to the church, right? So this is a great tool you can use with past clients who already know you, but it's also a great tool you can use for lead generation in your new market as well, okay? So it costs $79 per month. If you're going to do this, you want to sign up through NAR because AdWorks is an NAR member benefit. So you want to Google AdWorks NAR member benefit and then you will get a discount. It's much more expensive if you sign up through AdWorks directly, okay? you get 2,500 impressions per month. So what that means is that people are going to see your ad 2,500 times, okay? So I try not to put more than 500 people in my campaign because I want each person to see my ad five times a month, okay? So that's what AdWorks calls a sphere campaign, which is my favorite type of campaign that they offer. Some other things that they offer would be um, you can do this same retargeting based on zip codes. So maybe in your new market, you want to market to a particular zip code. You can put that zip code in there and your ad will now show up to everybody in that zip code, okay? You can also do it as circle prospecting around listings. That's $59 per week. I don't think in this market where listings are selling really fast, that's very necessary. But maybe you have a listing that's gotten stale. It's been on the market a couple of weeks. Your sellers are starting to get really antsy. That might be a good time to do a listing ad like this. What happens then is you put your seller's email address in there. And now that ad is going to show up everywhere your seller is online. Okay. So it looks like you're advertising their home all over the internet. So in my opinion, it's not going to help sell a house. But what I have found is that it keeps my sellers really happy if we're a couple weeks in and I don't have an offer on their property yet. So I love AdWorks. It's a big part of our toolkit, okay? Somebody asked, is it legal to take people's private emails at school and use them to advertise? Yes, this is not considered spam. Um, you're not emailing to them. It's the same thing that like, um, you know, Nordstrom's does when they're targeting you with ads for boots that you looked at or McDonald's is sending you an ad. It's the exact same kind of thing. It's just retargeting, okay? So those client appreciation events, I think it's important to go back for those. So here are some ideas of different ones that you do that you can do in your old market. And then also give you some ideas for events you could do in your new market if you're trying to get established in a new market. So when you're just starting out, okay, maybe you're a new agent or maybe you're trying to start out in a new market. I think it's great to do small group activities. So what I first started off doing 
when I didn't have a lot of clients, I didn't want to do a big event and have nobody show up and it looks really weird for me, right? And awkward. So instead for the closing gift for my client, I would give them a menu and I would say, I want to throw basically a fun party for you to celebrate your closing. Here's 15 different ideas of activities that we can do. So we could go to a driving range. We could have a Manny Petty party. We could go to I fly, we could go to ax throwing or a high-end dartboard, whatever it is that you have in your area. And then I would say to them, I want you to pick, you know, 10 friends and a date. We're going to take your 10 friends out and we're just going to have a party to celebrate you having this new home, right? And it was a great lead generation event for me because it was a client appreciation event and a client closing gift for my client. But for me, I got to meet 10 of their friends and get to know them. And typically then those friends turned into clients down the road. So it really served as client gift, client event, and lead generation all wrapped into one. And oftentimes what I would do is I would reach out to their lender and I would see if the lender wanted to participate to split that cost with me as well. So to give you an idea, okay, Manny Petty party, you know, that typically was about, I would, they could pick a manicure or a pedicure. So that was about $30 on average per person. If I had 10 people, that was $300. If the lender split it with me, my cost was $150. And so essentially that's what I would have spent on their closing gift anyway, but I'm able to pick up a whole bunch of new clients. So for any event that I do, I always ask for sponsors, okay? So if it's an event for a client like this, I would have somebody who is part of the transaction, like the lender, see if they want to sponsor so it's not weird having somebody else sponsor. If I'm just doing a big general client event, like for Valentine's Day every year, we always rent out a hair salon and we invite all of our female clients to come and get their hair blown out. And then um, we invite them to bring a friend with them. That I always have two sponsors. So I'll ask, you know, maybe one of our painters that we send a lot of business to or a lender or a title company or something like that so that I can keep my costs lower, okay? So some other ideas that you can do would be an outdoor photo shoot. So Karen said, we can only give up to $50 for a thank you gift for clients in Texas. Correct. That's why I love this idea because it's, it's an event. You're doing a client event. It is marketing. It is lead generation, right? So um, Nancy said, is that a RESPA violation? No, you're doing a marketing event essentially, right? So it's not a RESPA violation, okay? So some other things that you can do um, would be an outdoor photo shoot. So every year we hire a photographer, we pay that photographer $20. Our clients come for a mini photo session, so it's 10 minutes. Um, so one year we'll do it at like a park, another year we'll do it at like a cool mural or something like that. And everybody will come, they'll do their photos for about 10 minutes. They'll go home. Later on, the photographer will send them their photos. They get to pick one photo that they want for free. And then if they want additional photos, then they pay the photographer directly. And it's like $15 for additional photos. So our clients love that event. They get to come, get their family photos done. They get one free photo and then they can buy additional ones as, as, as well, right? So those are some great ideas to do when you're a smaller agent starting out and you don't have a lot of clients. Another great idea that I loved was Along the photo shoot idea in my new neighborhood, we have a clubhouse. And so a real estate agent in my neighborhood did Santa photos. And so she hired a Santa, a photographer. She did it at the clubhouse. She decorated. So it looked super cute. And everybody came and signed up for five minute sessions. And you went and got to chat with Santa and have your, you know, your kids Santa photo taken. And so it was a fabulous event. And I know she picked up a ton of clients from that, right? So you can do it for different themes and holidays throughout the year. Somebody asked, um, is it a rest a violation um, with the lender contributing. No, they just can't pay you. The lender has to pay half of the cost of the event to the, you know, the venue that is hosting the event. Okay. So if you have a lot of clients, you can do some bigger events. So one of the things that I like to do is every year we rent a movie theater and we invite all of our clients to come. And again, we always, for all of our events, invite them to bring a friends with them essentially, because I want it to be lead generation. So they can bring another family with them. We typically do two movies. We'll do one more geared towards adults and one more geared towards family. Um, they come, they get tickets. We give everybody who comes a $10 gift card to the concessions and they can go and get some food at the concessions, enjoy the movie, right? We always do a Thanksgiving pickup 
pie pickup, which I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, during the winter, we'll do an indoor kid-friendly play place um, where everybody can come play. You know, for the younger kids, we'll have pizza and juice and all those kinds of things. This past summer, we did an ice cream social that I flew back for. So kind of like we're doing next week with the donuts, we picked five or six different locations around the Chicago city and the suburbs. We had certain days and times where I was there, they could come by, um, bring friends with them, have an ice cream cone on me, right? So make sure you are doing regular events, both in your old city and potentially in your new city. I also think it's really important to do pot buys. So I showed you some examples of pot buys that you don't necessarily have to drop off to everybody. I do like to do pot buys where I drop things off as well once a year. Um, so one year we did Girl Scout cookies. So people picked what, um, three boxes of Girl Scout cookies they want and we drop those off to everybody. So my cost was about $15, right? Um, we've done holiday cookie decorating kits for Halloween where we drop off cookies with, you know, stuff for them to decorate. We've done hot chocolate bombs that we'll drop off, you know, all sorts of things. If it's a really great client, maybe I'll drop off birthday balloons outside their home on their birthday to say happy birthday, right? So, you know, I would try to do at least one pop by to everybody a year, fly in for that, or you could just hire some teenagers to go drop it off at their door if you don't want to fly in for it, right? So lots of different ideas you can do. In your new area, hire Christmas carols in your new neighborhood. Have them go around and serenade everybody, right? That'll get you attention really quickly as a realtor in your area, okay? Um, these are some examples of the um, hot chocolate bombs for our pop buys that we did. Um, so we left these on everybody's doorstep just with a little note. What I love about doing pop buys is that they're very visual. And so a lot of times people then will take pictures of them and post them on social media and thank you for them. And so then all of their family and friends are able to see the cool things that you did, okay? All right, so some other things I think it's important to do are those regular emails where you're checking in with all of your past clients in your past sphere. So these are maintenance reminders that we do. Um, and so these we just created one time, they go out quarterly and it's all sorts of home maintenance checklists. We typically just send these out via email, um, but you could certainly make these as printed postcards and send those out instead. And we just make sure that everything we send out has our contact information on it. So you can see it's got our logo at the bottom of this. This is coming via email. Each of the pop buys, we always have some sort of tag on them with a little note about what the pop buy is. It's got our contact information so they know who it's coming from, et cetera, okay? We also like to every other month send out kind of funny postcards that list all of the events coming up in the area. So you could do this for your old market and this would be something very easy to do for your new market as well, you know, in your new neighborhood or something like that. So this one we did for Groundhog's Day. Um, and then we have a list of all the upcoming like festivals and things. And these we just mail out to everybody. And what I like about these is I do tend to find people keep these and put them on their fridge because it'll have all the local upcoming festivals and things like that listed. Okay. I think it's also really important that you have to gift program. So this is some examples of our gift program. So for anybody who um, I see online, maybe on Facebook, that they have uh, a baby or that they're pregnant or hear about it, we will send them a baby onesie that says, I bought my crib from the Buy, Sell, Love Chicago team. If we found out they got engaged, we'll have some luggage tags and champagne sent to them. If they got a new job, we will send them chocolate covered strawberries from Sherry's Berries. Um, if they got a, a dog, then we have dog poop bag holders with my contact information and the team's information on them that we'll send to them and say congratulations on the new dog. Um, if they had a death in the family, we typically send them wind chimes and say that, you know, we hope that, you know, every time they hear these wind chimes, they remember their loved one. Then we also have gifts that are part of the transaction process. So when we do that initial Zoom consultation with them for a new buyer or a seller, then we will send them chocolate covered strawberries, ideally to arrive the next day um, from us. After the inspection, we will send them a box from Tiffany's. So uh, with either champagne glasses or, um, or wine glasses in them. Those are $60 for two, including free shipping. They come in the really nice blue box with the white ribbon. We typically send gifts to people's offices if they're in the offices rather than in 
to their home because I want all of their colleagues at work to see the cool gifts that their realtors send them. Again, I'm always thinking about how can I generate new additional leads, okay? For the closing gift, um, if I'm not doing that small, like, you know, the event kind of menu of things that they can do, then instead we will send them an email where they get to choose four different gifts. So they get their choice of a handyman to come over for three hours and do handyman work. Um, they can choose our cleaning person to come over and clean their property for three hours. They can choose our photographer to come over and do like porch photos of their new home or they can choose a gift card to their favorite store. And I have pre-negotiated that each of those costs are gonna be $125 so that I know exactly what that closing gift is going to cost me, okay? Um, I also do meal for the move, so pizza delivery. Um, so we will have a form that goes out to them that says, you know, we wanna provide pizza on your upcoming move, please fill this out. Um, you know, we'll send over two uh, large pizzas with whatever toppings they want, and then two liter bottles of soda as well. We also send them Christmas ornaments um, to them. So somebody, Sean said, I'm spending way more than $50 per client. I guess, yep, totally. You just can't write off all of that, but you can spend whatever you want on your clients. Um, and again, I typically have sponsors for these gifts. So, you know, if it's a buyer, I go to the lender and say, hey, I have this extensive gift program. Would you like to participate in it? And we'll share the cost and they will pay half of the cost to the vendor for these things that we're doing, right? And then their name goes on and my name goes on it too, okay? Um, so, you know, certainly, you can, you know, spend what you want. Um, you just can't necessarily write it all off. Okay. All right. So these are some examples. These are the baby onesies on the right hand side. Um, and then the poop bag dog holders on the left hand side. Now, those are kind of a lot of ideas that I gave you both to stay in contact with agents in the old market. And then also things you can do in your new market, okay? So for the last little bit of time, I'm gonna focus on starting over in a new city and some additional tips for that, okay? So if I were to start over in a new city, if I were going to get my license in Denver, I would really look at a brokerage that was a big brokerage that had agents that were too busy to handle all of their work and were very collaborative so that I could talk to the managing broker and say, hey, who needs open house help? Who needs showing help, right? Who can I help to kind of get my foot in the door and start to learn about this market and how it works, right? I think the other thing I would really look at seriously is joining a team, right? So that I could learn who the good inspectors are. Um, you know, how are contracts written in that new city? What are the inspection issues that I need to be looking at, right? And then the other thing that I would do is look at what are the standards in that city and how can I do a better job than all of the agents in that city? For instance, I will tell you, Den the Denver market was very disappointing to me when I was looking to buy a home. Very few of the properties had floor plans. Very few of the properties had Matterport 3D tours, right? A lot of them didn't even have very good photos. So, you know, immediately I would look to elevate those standards. So anytime I take a listing, we do at least 25 photos with very high quality photos. We do a floor plan for every property, regardless of the price point. We also do a 3D Matterport tour, okay? Um, and, you know, so look at how can you do a better job from anybody else, okay, than your market. And then check out market stats. Look for, you know, what properties, you know, what are the types of properties that people are looking for? Like get to know your MLS data really, really well, and then find good referral sources in your new city, right? So my lenders tend to be fantastic referral sources for me, right? So start to develop relationships with lenders, financial planners, divorce attorneys are great referral sources for me. So reach out to divorce attorneys in your new city and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm new to the area. I'm starting to look for divorce attorneys that I can start to send my clients to, you know, would it be possible for me to send clients to you and learn a little bit more about your business? You need to put your Rolodex together of service providers, because that's one of the biggest thing I provide my clients is that I have fantastic electricians, painters, financial planners. I have everybody that I can refer them to. So work on creating that in your new city. And then hopefully those people will start to give you referrals as well, right? I think it's also really important that you get to know inspection item issues in your new city. So I did this in Chicago when I started there. I paid an inspector and I followed them around to learn everything I could about inspection issues because inspection issues 
are probably going to be different in that other state that you're moving to rather than the state that you're coming from. So you need to get to know those. Maybe radon is a big issue. There are termites and you didn't deal with that where you're coming from. So get to know that, right? I think one of the best things you can do is start some very specific Facebook pages, which I'll show you. So one of the things that I loved, and I'll just going to flip forward to this and I'll come back, was when we moved to Denver, there was a realtor who started a Facebook page called Moving to Denver, Colorado. She had about 5,000 people in it and she cleans up from this page, right? So a ton of people will join and say, hey, I'm thinking about moving to Denver from Texas. I don't know anything about it. Here are my questions. And other people will chime in. She obviously has to be careful about not violating fair housing or redlining or steering, but other people can jump in and ask people's questions. And so she gets a ton of business from this. And what I think is fascinating about this is you have to join, you have to fill out a form because this is a private group in order to join the group. And so she asks on there point blank, you know, are you a realtor? Because if you're a realtor, she does not let you in the group. I'm only allowed in because I'm not a realtor in Denver, right? And then she will also ask you, you know, are you planning to buy or rent? When are you planning to move? Would you like me to help you find a property? I mean, so she's very direct about her questions and she gets a lot of clients because of it, okay? Now it's been so successful. Now she has a moving to um, page for each of the suburbs around Denver as well, right? So something free and quick and easy that you can start in your new city, it's gonna take some time to build up, but could become a great referral source for you, okay? Another one I love is this page, Denver Locals. So they basically highlight a lot of local businesses. So each week they'll, you know, do some photos at a local business and talk about this cool local business, right? So even if you're new to the area, try to position yourself as an expert, um, you know, and share that expertise with people, okay? So I'm gonna go back for a second. The other thing I would say to do is create a networking group in your new city, right? So we have this in Chicago. We typically close about $10 million a year from our networking group. And what we do is we have one person from each industry. So it's kind of like a BNI, but I find typically you can't get into BNI because they've all been started by realtors. So we have one person from each industry. So some of our best referral sources, as I mentioned, divorce attorneys, lenders, okay, um, insurance providers. Uh, personal trainers, will and trust attorneys, right? Think about people who really get to talk with their clients and see if they would be willing to join your group. And then we meet every other month. We do it over Zoom now because of COVID for lunch. Everybody has three minutes to go around the group and ask for three referrals. So everybody writes them down. They can be business or personal referrals. And then we meet on Fridays. By Sunday, those referrals are due. So everybody has to have given their referrals out and you have to give out a minimum of 12 referrals a year in order to stay in the group. If you don't give out that many, you get kicked out of the group, okay? So easy way, it doesn't cost me anything to do this, but I close about $10 million a year in business from this group, okay? I like this better than BNI, which is a very kind of famous networking group that exists all over the country. I haven't heard of it before because I only have to meet with them every month. BNI, you have to meet every week and that's a lot for me and they're typically in the mornings. I don't wanna get up that early. So this is a much more laid back way to get the same kind of results, okay? Um, some other things that you can do online in your new area. We do Santa letters, okay? So we do letters to Santa. So we do Facebook ads and we say, you know, fill out this personalized form about your child or your, you know, nephew or grandchild or whatever it is, you know, tell us what they want for Christmas, where they're going to be spending Christmas, et cetera. And then we will write letters to them. We send them to the North Pole in Alaska. They stamp them and send them back to the, to the kids. So this is a great way to grow your database in a new market. Okay. These are some examples of the letters that we send out. So we change them every year because we send it out to our sphere as well. And so we have a lot of people who sign up year after year. Another quick way, and then I'll open it up for questions to get listings in your new city or your old city is if you're in a seasonal market where it snows every August, we send an email out to everybody in our market and we say, hey, if you are thinking of selling this winter or early next spring, let's take your exterior photos now while the trees are green and the flowers are blooming and all of those kinds of things, right? And so typically we pick up about a dozen new clients that way. 
The trick is you can't just send it out once. You have to send it out, I think, at least four or five times. So we typically start sending it out in August. We send it out once a week for August and September because people need that reminder. And then the photographer just goes by whenever it works for the clients and takes just their exterior photos. We have them sign the listing agreement before we send the photographer out. That way we know they're our client. And then over the next couple of months, we can work with them on interior repairs that need to get done, you know, painting, all of that kind of stuff so that they're ready to list next spring, okay? So a simple idea, again, that you can do that doesn't cost a lot of money. Again, we talked about those online Zoom classes. You can do 10 things to know about buying in 2021, 10 things to know about selling. We recently did a class for investors that went really well. And so we got a new bunch of new investment clients. These are short 30 minute classes done via Zoom. We advertise them six weeks in advance. We also do Facebook ads to advertise them to new people. We always have referral partners who are part of these classes. So a lender will come in and talk about financing questions. We might have a financial planner there as well. 20 minute classes and then 10 minutes for questions afterwards. We advertise those typically on Facebook and then on Instagram. We send them out via our sphere, via email as well. Okay. Last thing is, you know, in your new market, figure out again how you can be different. So, this is an example of a sign that we have at every listing when people come walk in the door. And then we have these little signs that tell the ages of things and features they might miss in the home that are around the property that people can look at and get information without you know, having to bother anybody with questions that they have about the property. So think about how can you be better than all of the agents in your current marketplace, okay? So I know we are running out of time. I wanna open this up for questions. I tried to answer as many questions as I could in the chat. If you have questions I didn't answer, please go ahead and type them in the chat again, and I will take a few minutes to answer those questions. Hopefully you got a lot of good ideas, both for your old area, your new area, or maybe you want to work in both areas. Um, so somebody asked, who's my CRM? I use Realvolve for my CRM. What I like about Realvolve is that, um, it can go out based on targeted dates in the transaction. Somebody asked, um, who, what does my client concierge do? So she sends, so she is the person who basically is the assistant for our clients. So we tell them if they would like estimates done, if they would like um, additional supplementary inspection set up, if they're buyers, she will coordinate that. If they are sellers, she will coordinate all the repairs that need to get done. So they just tell her who they want to use. She'll coordinate it. She'll even go there and oversee the work. They pay the bill. Um, she takes care of sending out all of our client gifts. Um, all of those kinds of things. She will get moving quotes for clients if they would like. She's even gone there and overseen packers and movers if they're going to be out of town. She is really there to be helpful for them. Uh, somebody asked, how do you create that client list in Facebook? So you can only do that on the computer. You cannot do it on your mobile phone. It's called a friend list. So if you just Google how to create a friend list in Facebook, you should be able to find instructions for that as well. Um, let's see what other questions. How can you watch it again? You're going to get a recording of this sent to you via email afterwards so that you can uh, watch it again. Um, and that'll have a copy of the slide deck as well. Uh, suggestions for recruiting agents in your previous market to run the team once you leave. Honestly, how I found my agents was I went back through the transactions that I had done and I thought about who was a really good agent to work with on the other side of the transaction and I contacted them and I said, I really loved working with you. I'm going to be moving out of town. I'm looking for somebody to partner with. You know, would that interest you at all? Let's talk about it. And that's how I found Lauren and she's been a fantastic addition to the team. You know, so think about what agents that you worked with who were really impressive and reach out to them. Um, do I have referrals for services that you use that are not location specific like floor plans? I don't, I know boxbrownie.com does floor plans. I've heard they're really great um, and they're all across the world, you know, so you could potentially use them for a floor plan. Otherwise, I think it's important. I like using local people and supporting local businesses. Are all of my team members licensed? Somebody asked. Um, so only the agents on my team are licensed. So David and Lauren who do all the showings and things like that. And then the showing agents are licensed. Otherwise, our assistants are not licensed. They are not doing anything that requires them to have a license. Uh, Michelle asks, how long did it take you to get all of these ideas put together? 
Um, you know, I really started putting together kind of these ideas when I first started my business. We've always done events and pop buys and marketing and things like that. We just ramped it up a notch when I decided to leave town. Okay. Uh, what is my primary lead source, Liz asked. Um, the vast majority, about 90% of my uh, leads come from past clients and sphere. So that's why we spend a lot of time and money doing events, doing pop buys, doing um, you know, uh, marketing postcards, things like that. My feeling is that you are much better off spending money on past clients than you are to try to get cold leads and spend money on new clients. That's much harder. So I think a lot of agents kind of leave their past clients at the door when the transaction closes. And I don't, I really heavily focus on those clients and that's how I've been able to grow my business. How do I handle dating on a pre-listing contract when you take exterior shots for a later listing? Um, so we have a form in our market that allows us to um, say essentially that we're taking photos now, but we're not going to be putting the property on for some time in the next year. So we have them fill out that exemption form and that's how we handle it. Um, can you ask other companies, realtors, to do open house for them? Typically not. Usually your brokerage is not going to allow you to have showing assistance or people do open houses for you if they are not part of your brokerage, because then it will not be covered by E&O insurance. Uh, somebody asked, do I put myself as the lister and your agent as the co-lister? Yes. Um, so for listings as well, we have two agents assigned and one I'm the lister and then somebody else is the co-lister. Uh, let's see, I know we are over, so let me just see if there's any uh, more questions that I can answer quickly. Is the CRM paid? Yes, I pay for my CRM. I pay for Realvolve. I think I pay about $50 a month, something like that. So I think we are out of time to answer questions. I really appreciate you all attending today. I hope you got some good information. Good luck, everybody. If you want to move, move. You can run your real estate business from anywhere as long as you have a Zoom connection or some sign of online connection. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I will also post a copy of the slides on my uh, business Facebook page, which is Shea Hada Real Estate Speaker and Coach. That's Shea Hada Real Estate Speaker and Coach. So you can go down there for a um, copy of the slides as well. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to put them there and I will do my best to answer them over the coming days. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, NAR, for having me. I really appreciate it.